SJC 11717, Commonwealth v. Robert Jones. Good morning, Your Honors. Rebecca Jacobstein for Robert Jones. The dissemination statute was overbroad during the time frame covered by the indictment. But although it has since been changed, Mr. Jones can still challenge the constitutionality of the original statute. And the reason that he can do this is because in Massachusetts v. Oaks, five justices agreed that overbroad statutes could be cured or could not be cured by subsequent legislative action. And that is the opinion that controls in this case um, because, well, because five is more than four. And <laughs> the, that's how the federal circuits are are interpreting fragmented opinions now. They are looking to the principles embraced by the majority, um, and they are looking to produce results that a majority would agree with. So are you, are you suggesting here that we need to decide that the statute was unconstitutionally overbroad prior to 2010, which of course no, of course no one else has ever decided? No, no one has decided that. So that we need to decide that first? That well, it was I think overbroad? first you would have to decide that I could challenge it, and then you would decide that it was overbroad. Well, how can you, you, could, you can challenge it if what? Well, it's been amended, and so um, the Commonwealth is arguing that the issue is moot because the amended statute is Take that out of the equation. Okay. <clears throat> so now. But because we're not talking about the amendments at no. all, really. So you want me to argue why the you, you said the You said the statute as it existed from 2007 to 2009, long before the federal court said that the 2010 amendment made the statute overbroad, is overbroad. Yes. Right? And it's unconstitutional because yes. of that. So we need to decide that for you to win, first yes. of all, that it was overbroad and unconstitutional. Yes. And we can't possibly interpret it now not to be? Well, your honors could interpreted it, it, um, by through a limiting construction. Um, that's what they did, for instance, in the, in the Supreme Court in the Osborne case. They, right. um, and you all did that in Disler. But I would argue that that's not appropriate here. And the reason that that is not appropriate here um, is one, because the fact that the legislature changed the statute indicated that it was a strict liability statute, but also because the legislature in, in statutes to protect children has strict liability statutes. They do that, they did that for the school zone statute is strict liability and the statutory rape statute is strict liability. And it can't, shouldn't be allowed to get away with strict liability in the First Amendment realm. Um, and so I'm arguing that because the First Amendment is so important, we need to incentivize the legislature to narrowly tailor their statutes so that First Amendment rights are not chilled. Even, even when it comes to protecting children, we still need to um, we still need to protect First Amendment but rights. How does go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Now, how does that bear on whether or not we shouldn't simply interpret the statute as it existed from 2007 to 2009 <clears throat> as including or in requiring uh, that the individual who disseminated the pornographic or the inappropriate material knew he was disseminating it to a child. Why, why couldn't we say, of course it includes that requirement? It's well, implicit that it includes that requirement. We would interpret it to include that requirement. Otherwise, it, would, it might be cons unconstitutional. Why couldn't we do that now? You could. I'm just arguing that you shouldn't because... Because this is such a sympathetic case? I'm not arguing that. I am, however, arguing that, one, you know, some, you, you do do that in, in conduct-based um, like for instance, I, I think the one I'm thinking of is, is Disler, where there's conduct at issue. This is speech, and speech is important. You know, it's, it's, and I think it's more important than, it, you know, it's, it's, it's the First Amendment for a reason. I mean, you need well, to. Wasn't your client having this child look at, look at the pornographic? There is no, I am not making an ad as applied challenge, Your Honor. There is no question. Right, but I'm just saying it's more conduct at issue here than speech. Well, it's the dissemination. Um, of material is speech. Well, I understand that, but, well, I mean, this, that, that goes to the overbreadth. Right, right. right. Um, <clears throat> and 
as uh, Justice Scalia said, um, if the promulgation of overbroad laws affecting speech was cost-free, legislatures um, would have significantly reduced incentive to stay within constitutional bounds in the first place. And so that's why I'm asking your honors not to put a limiting construction because one, they, the, the legislature does strict liability and I think that there's every reason to think that they did do strict liability in this case and two, because that it would make it cost-free for them. Well, but that means that this Justice Scalia's argument really focused on why it should not be mooted by revision. He didn't. Yes. He said it with respect to that. I'm saying with respect to this. Um, but I think it still but, but applies. But with regard to limiting interpretation, we do that. We, we save statutes all the time to preserve their constitutionality. We don't sit there and say we're going to teach the legislature to be more protective of First Amendment rights and we're going to declare it unconstitutional to teach them a lesson, we narrow its scope. We've done that with regard to the harassment statutes and with regard to a number of other statutes. Yes, Your Honor. And, and I recognize that you could do so here. But just because um, the legislature has fixed it, you all don't really need to, I guess, retroactively fix it. But wouldn't we have to hear in the sense that, well, I mean, I guess it's we would since this, this occurred before the revision. Right. So we're interpreting the older statute. Right. So if we were to narrow its scope, it would apply to any case that may emerge, that may have been tried or that, that may have been heard before the revision. Correct. Uh, and if we do that, then we don't need to reach the issue of whether we have this unusual situation of four justices who are declaring the judgment to be in the minority, although we have a similar case with regard to the recent U.S. Supreme, the year ago, the U.S. Supreme Court case had the same thing with regard to a 5-4. It's become increasingly typical that the dissent says we actually are the majority as to certain issues. Yes. Yeah, no, I, 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 I agree. Um, I guess you could preempt, say, well, we're not going to decide whether this is moot. We're just going to decide the constitutionality of the statute. And you could do. Because I, I noticed that, that Judge Zobel, in her decision, the, what was it, the American Book? I the American Booksellers. American Booksellers says, well, I mean, unfortunately, I'm not in a position to construe the statute narrowly because federal judges don't do that with respect to state judges. But state judges do that with respect to state statutes. She definitely left the door open for you to do it. Yes, Your Honor. <clears throat> um, with respect to, um, I just want to briefly, briefly address uh, my closing argument issue. I just wanted to I make sure. Be before you get there, sure. with regard to construing it to be the narrowest focus of the U.S. Supreme Court, has that ever been done in a context in which the narrowest focus is in the dissent? The cases that I have read about fragmented opinions have looked to the Marx case and they have said the problem with Marx is, is that it's a subset, right? So if you do use Marx, you have to use majority, it has to be a majority um, and you just take the narrowest majority opinion. Um, but for instance, in Johnson, and I unfortunately don't remember the result in Johnson, it was a waterways issue. Um, they say Marx doesn't work. The narrowest grounds doesn't work if one opinion is not a subset of the other opinion. And so the Marx test has fallen in disfavor for that reason. And this is one of those cases where you don't have a, a, a big opinion and then a, and then a subset opinion. Um, you just have two different opinions. And one has five votes and one has four, but the five votes couldn't agree on a disposition, so they had to fragment into three and two. Um, but what they did agree on is Justice Scalia's, part one of Justice Scalia's opinion. Uh, so I, I do believe that now they are cobbling together concurrences and dissents to get a majority, um, not I guess opinion's not the right word, but to get majority principles that, that they should be following instead of just saying, well, the plurality had the mm -hmm. most votes and so it gets it even though the other five people totally disagreed. I, I, they're not doing that anymore. They being whom? 
They being, I believe, the federal courts who I, that I looked at. So like the First Circuit's not doing that, the Fifth Circuit's not doing that. They are doing a um, look to the pr principles that the majority embraced, not a, well, what did the plurality say, and then how do we get to a majority from there? Um, because, again, that doesn't work, if, for instance. You mean, what, what did the principles that five justices embraced, not, exactly. not the, not the, there right. wasn't a majority. Right, you looked to what the five, to what five people would agree with on the court. And so the cases that I present for that are the Johnson case out of the First Circuit and also um, the League of Latin American Citizens out of the Fifth Circuit. And those are both in my, I believe, in my reply. Uh, with regard to the closing argument, uh, <clears throat> I understand your point, but would it have been okay to, given the defendant's argument, uh, if he had simply said that one can infer that his motive was to groom them for future sexuality as opposed to predicting that that's what would have happened. I think you probably could have said that because you could, you're, you're pulling an inference as, and instead of, saying, instead of saying, this guy's a sexual predator, you've gotta stop him. You, can, you know, you're saying this is, a, this is an inference, but um, I think it's close because what you're doing is you're not saying, here, look at these facts and see what he did. You're saying, here, look at these facts and you've got to convict him because guess what he might have done? Um, I, you know, what if we let him keep doing that? And, and that's what I'm arguing is, is so prejudicial here is that um, it, you know, if, if the jurors were on the fence as to whether or not this was indecent, appealing to their fears and emotions with respect to sexual predators really would have tipped the scales. And was there an objection in closing argument? No, this is a substantial risk. So, all right. All right, if there are no further questions, I rest on my briefs. Thank all you. Right, thank Thanks. you. Good morning, Your Honors. My name is Anne Perruti. I'm an assistant district attorney for Middlesex. I was also the trial attorney for the Commonwealth in this case. Um, here, when you're looking at uh, the statute regarding dissemination of matter harmful to a minor, I think it's clear based on this court's interpretation of Supreme Court uh, jurisprudence, as well as other courts across the country, um, that the 2011 amendment to chapter 272, section 28, cured any alleged constitutional defect um, in the statute, and therefore any challenge, facial challenge now um, to that statute um, is moot. That's what uh, the Supreme Court um, ruled in Massachusetts versus Oaks. That's what- well, well, but less than, fewer than five. Yes, Your Honor, and so, so the ruling of Oaks, what actually happened as a result of Massachusetts versus Oaks, is that the constitutional challenge was not reached. The underlying courts, this court's um, ruling that the statute was overbroad, facially overbroad, um, was vacated, and the case was remanded to the Supreme Judicial Court to analyze an as-applied challenge. That I recognize, um, and it's undisputed, obviously, that Justice Scalia wrote certain ideas and principles, as we've referenced them today, <clears throat> that other justices, for to be exact, joined him in. However, that doesn't change the result of Oaks. And this court itself, Justice Abrams, in um, writing the following opinion, um, in which the Supreme Judicial Court um, actually found that as applied to that def defendant, to Mr. Oaks, the statute was not overbroad, recognized that the opinion of the plurality, Justice O'Connor, was what the SJC followed, and it's what every other jurisdiction, federal appeal, appellate court, has followed as well. I've listed in my brief a number of circuit courts of appeal that have recognized Massachusetts versus Oaks specifically for that premise. That is, that where a statutory amendment remedies uh, perceived constitutional defect, in this case, the uh, overbreath challenge, then any challenge at that point is moot. And that's precisely for the reasons that Justice O'Connor from the Supreme Court wrote about. And that's what this court, your honors, have asked about. What is the point of um, us arguing this here today? Do you need to 
find that this statute was unconstitutionally <coughs> overbroad? And the answer to that is counsel um, instructed the court is no, because the legislature has already done that. One of the justices, uh, one of your honors asked um, during my sister's argument whether or not that issue had ever been um, decided, namely whether or not this statute during that time period covered by the indictments in this case was ruled unconstitutionally overbroad um, from a facial perspective, obviously, not as applied. And um, as you noted, um, as Justice Cordy noted in American Booksellers, the uh, <coughs> district court for Massachusetts did in fact um, at, le at the very least observe that the statute was unconstitutionally overbroad in a certain, uh, in response to an amendment that had been made um, months, literally months prior. In recognition of the way the statute changed after that initial amendment in 2010, the Commonwealth, represented by the Attorney General at that stage, um, in fact conceded that based on the new, the new interpretation um, or the new statutory language that was itself a response to um, judicial interpretation of the statute, recognized that yes, there could be some situations where um, it could be applied in a way that is not constitutional. The legislature, listening to the courts in that sense, and as, the, as your honors have recognized, federal courts can limit state statutes differently than state courts can. Um, but the legislature listened to that judicial opinion and in fact amended the statute further to cure that perceived constitutional defect. So here, specifically where there is no as applied challenge, there's no sense for this court to um, make that decision whether or not the statute in 2007 or 2009 was overbroad because it doesn't benefit any person now to do so where there's no danger at this point that any other person besides this defendant might have their speech or in this case I think what's more uh, why couldn't we just interpret the statute to in, in a way to ensure that it wasn't overbroad as it existed from 2007 to 2009. That's the, I mean, and I take it the jury instruction here was pursuant to 2011 amend amendment, right? Correct. Which required the essentially knowing that it was being disseminated to someone under 14. <clears throat> Correct. And I think, I think it's um, somewhat- Why couldn't we interpret to the statute as it existed in 2007 and 2009 to create a, a knowing dissemination as opposed to an unknowing dissemination to someone under 14. I think you. I think the court could absolutely, if it deemed it necessary. The point I think of um, that Justice O'Connor makes in Massachusetts versus Oaks, and that this court has accepted, is that you don't need to. And so, where you don't need to um, read limitations into the statute the court typically will avoid having to do so because that's the realm of the legislature. Well, certainly in Osborne, the Supreme Court judges, in this case five at least, said that, well, statutory amendments might or might not be effective, but surely Supreme Courts of states can interpret the statutes narrowly, and that's not a problem. And I agree with that, and I think, I think the issue there is that the legislature has already done what this court would be asked to do at this point. If there was no, in the absence of an as-applied challenge, if Mr. Jones through counsel was challenging <coughs> the overbreadth of the statute, um, it was mounting a facial challenge, I think this court absolutely and, could do that. Well, the, the amendment in 2010 really added some additional things to the statute that have no bearing here. Absolutely. None. Uh, that was this electronic communications, email, internet stuff. That's exactly. got nothing to do with this case. Exactly. Which is why there's no as applied challenge here, which is why the facial challenge is the only challenge that counsel has, or that the defendant, I should say, has to, quote, as the court put it, to win. Um, and I think when you look at it that way, specifically, why don't you just limit the statute? The answer is because you don't need to. It's already been done for you. And where it doesn't apply here, there's no, there's no reason, I think, at this point for the court, for your honors, to embark on that. On Do we that really task. want to step between the circuit courts and the Supreme Court as to 
when four equals five or when five, when, I mean, do we really want to get in the middle of that? I assume you don't. I don't think you need to, frankly, because when we're looking at, that's more of, I think, an academic view. We're talking about looking at, what council's talking about is looking at what equals a majority, what equals a binding holding. What this court is tasked with today is looking at what does Massachusetts versus Oaks stand for, and you already have the guidance. What if from it's wrong? Excuse me, I didn't hear what if Massachusetts? What if our decision in, in, that came after remand is incorrect because there wasn't a majority? I mean, that, that relying on Justice O'Connor's plurality really wasn't a plurality. Well, I don't think that this court was wrong, Your Honor, and I think that you can look to how other courts have interpreted that specific decision, not the idea of pluralities versus dissents versus majorities, but that specific opinion. And when you go through the circuits, the First Circuit hasn't addressed that particular holding, Massachusetts versus Oaks, um, and the Fifth Circuit has not. Every other circuit, um, the Second, Third, Fourth, Sixth, Seventh, Eighth, Ninth, excuse me, not the ninth, the eleventh, have specifically cited from as long ago as 1990, pardon me, two, to as recently as this year, 2014, the Second Circuit has um, one of a few different decisions, newly issued now, um, that specifically cites the plurality for that proposition. Granted, it's not, uh, none of those cases are are uh, in-depth examinations of the breakdown between the plurality and the and um, the dissents or concurring opinions in Massachusetts versus Oaks, but nonetheless, they cite Massachusetts versus Oaks for that proposition, namely that because of the statutory amendments, which cured the perceived constitutional defect, the overbreadth challenge at that level was mooted, was moot, excuse me, and that's exactly where we are here today, and. Uh, Again, I think that Justice Cordy's point is well taken. Why can't we just do it anyway? You could if it hadn't been done already for you, and that's the whole point. And what Justice Well, but actually, he's making a different point, I think. You're saying we should find it moot. I think what I hear him suggesting is that we don't address the mootness and simply interpret the statute to incorporate that uh, so as to avoid the problem of saying we're going to take a position that five justices of the U.S. Supreme Court have rejected because five of them joined Justice Scalia's part one, which said a statute that is unconstitutional does not become constitutional after the legislature amends it. That was his, that was, the, that was what five justices joined. Correct, I agree with your honor. And I think what, what I meant to um, say or imply is that for the, this court to, to address the statute and apply limiting, um, constructions on the statute is something that you could certainly do and it's in your power to do. However, the practicality of that, I think, is what transcends the more academic argument there because it's already been done in ways that at this point have rendered the statute constitutional or in keeping with the, with the bounds of the <coughs> Constitution. And so the court certainly could do what Justice Cordy is, is suggesting, but I, I think when you step back and take a look at the reason for the overbreadth doctrine, which as Justice O'Connor recognizes is a judicially created doctrine that um, the court employs when it is looking for salutary um, results. That is, when it's going to help other people in the future. At this point, anyone else who was prejudiced um, by whatever constitutional defect there was, specifically in the context of an over, over broadness or over breadth, has had that remedy because of the, <coughs> because of the amendments to the statute. If there do, for example, happen to remain some individuals, um, presumably criminal defendants, who have been convicted under an unconstitutional statute, they have remedies before them in the courts and in appellate procedure. And so I think that looking at the reasoning before and underlying this judicially created doctrine, um, I think compels the court to, um, to agree with its predecessors and with um, several of uh, the other appellate courts across the country in interpreting uh, Massachusetts versus Oaks as it has. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, with respect to 
um, the closing argument made by the Commonwealth um, at the trial level. Um, the First of all, I would submit as the trial attorney and after having the benefit of a transcript to review um, that there was no error in closing at all, that all of the statements that are um, identified by the defendant in his uh, appeal were properly made in response to the defendant's closing argument and uh, properly requested or invited the jury to draw inferences from evidence that was before them. Um, the Commonwealth's argument did not invite the, the jury to engage in speculation or conjecture, and I think some of the, I think some of the uh, conclusions that are um, hinted at by the defendant or blatantly um, described um, by the defendant in his brief, um, I think really are are pretty substantial jumps from what actually um, is present in the language of the Commonwealth's closing argument. Didn't you say something to the effect of what could have happened? The, so in the closing argument, um, the Commonwealth commented on there were two victims, um, as the court knows from reading the facts um, elicited or uh, described in the transcript. I think the Commonwealth properly commented on the pattern of behavior um, that the defendant um, the defendant perpetrated against both boys. So for example, by looking at CJ, um, who was the first um, to be victimized by the defendant, the Commonwealth properly commented that the defendant um, started out with that particular nephew by asking him questions about puberty and by looking at uh, his pubic area with <coughs> asking him to disrobe so that he could do so. With JB, the other victim, who, uh, when you look at the dates, you can see that JB's victimization started after CJ's, but also coincided for some point. Um, and you can see that the defendant perpetrated the same behaviors on JB, such as starting with questions about puberty and then asking him to see his body, specifically his pubic area. With JB, the defendant, the evidence showed and um, the jury convicted on, um, the defendant took that pattern further and proceeded to touch the defendant in a way that was different and perhaps more invasive than he, the manner in which he touched CJ. But was and, there evidence that the, the defendant actually touched CJ's pubic area? There was evidence. That and, and, and that constitutes an indecent assault and battery? It does, yes. Um, and that and that's, goes to the, I think, heart of the argument, is that to be able to <clears throat> prove that a touching was indecent, the Commonwealth at trial has to show that the touching was indecent, that is um, contrary to contemporary morals, and that it was harmful or offensive or an affront to the victim's integrity. And by showing uh, the defendant's state of mind in the manner in which he touched, or in the manner in which he perpetrated that whole pattern, which started with talking, progressed to looking, progressed to touching, and then with JB, progressed finally to masturbating and disseminating pornography. Um, I think that the Commonwealth properly was able to draw the jury's attention to what happened with JB because it specifically informs uh, the jury about what the defendant's intent was with respect to CJ. And I think in that sense, it wasn't the com I don't think it's a fair inference at all from uh, the closing argument to say that the Commonwealth was uh, warning the jury about what might happen if this sexual predator was not convicted. I don't think that's a fair inference at all. I think the fairer inference is <coughs> what the Commonwealth argued, namely that his behavior informed his intent, um, and his intent then drove his behavior. All right, thank you. Thank you very much.